Hi, my name is Noah Hahn, and on behalf of the ECOG Akron Bladder Cancer Committee, I'm happy to welcome you to this informational session about a key pivotal trial that uh, is just now opening. Uh, this trial is a phase three trial of Durvalumab and chemotherapy for patients with high grade upper tract urothelial cancer prior to nephroureterectomy. It's ECOG Akron 8192. Uh, I'm joined today uh, with our uh, primary investigators and uh, collaborators uh, for this session. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Hoffman Census from Johns Hopkins is a medical oncologist who is the primary investigator of this study. Dr. Vitaly Margulis is a urologist from UT Southwestern who is heading up the urology portion of this trial in particular. And Dr. Petros Grivas from the University of Washington is a medical oncologist who's heading up much of the translation work in this particular study. So. Uh, Thank you. Thank you all for, for, for joining us today. Um, I think for this uh, particular uh, webinar session, uh, one of the main purposes is to inform our audience about the purpose of the trial, its goals, its impact, uh, both now and in the future. So I was wondering, Dr. Hoffman Census, if you might be able to provide a, just a brief overview of the trial, its design and its significance. Sure. Thanks, Noah. Thanks for the opportunity to talk mm. about this exciting study. So this is a unique study, um, kind of like the PALT trial, um, you know, building on the idea of the importance of perioperative chemotherapy. Um, we think it's very important to have a clinical trial just for patients with high-grade upper tract urothelial cancer. And that's uh, the patient population that this trial is focused on. This trial is for patients with high-grade tumors that are biopsy proven, where the patients are planned from their urologist to undergo a nephrourethectomy with the idea of curative intent. So patients uh, coming into this trial are oftentimes going to be referred by our urology colleagues. Um, the main driver, the main portion of the clinical trial is a large randomized portion for patients who are platinum eligible. Um, so that's going to be um, a combination of um, dose-dense MVAC chemotherapy, either with Dervalumab as the experimental arm or randomized to dose-dense MVAC alone. It'll be four neoadjuvant uh, cycles of chemotherapy and then followed by a planned surgery. We'll of course be looking at um, pathologic endpoints as well as survival endpoints. There's a smaller group also for patients who are not platinum eligible, uh, combining chemotherapy, gemcitabine with Dervalumab alone and the same paradigm, uh, patients who are planned for surgery, um, they'll have that preoperative treatment and then move on to standard surgery, as well as long-term follow-up um, as per standard with follow-up scans, as well as cystoscopies. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. Census. That is a great overview and uh, obviously of this very key trial. I was wondering a little bit, uh, Dr. Margulis, if you could kind of comment on uh, how did we get to this point? So, you know, this is a you know, a, a large trial, randomized phase three trial. Um, does this build off some prior work? And what's our experience in this space about, uh, you know, why we feel enthusiastic about this investigation? Yeah, thank you, Noah. And it's, it's a great segue to talk about the prior ECOG trial where we have targeted patients with high-grade urothelial cancer in a neoadjuvant setting uh, with an idea to see uh, if neoadjuvant platinum-based uh, 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 chemotherapy, number one, can be uh, delivered safely prior to nephrourectomy, and number two, produce uh, reliable pathologic outcomes. Um, and specifically, um, in the ECOC, prior ECOC trial, we're able to um, uh, randomize, not randomize, but enroll 30 patients uh, who were given dose-dense MVAC for four cycles, um, and these patients had good GFR in the second arm of this trial, targeted patients with GFR less than 60, and they were given gem carbo. Um, and what the trial has shown uh, is, uh, number one, that uh, patients can safely tolerate and receive uh, neoadjuvant platinum-based systemic chemotherapy and proceed to nephrourectomy without undue delay or without undue complications. Overall, grade three and four complication rate in this trial was 25%, I believe, without any grade five toxicities. And we have observed 15% uh, complete response rates in patients that got four doses, uh, four cycles of dose dense and back. Uh, at their nephrourectomy. So that, that's quite an impressive complete response rate. So we know that this, uh, this um, uh, therapy is effective, feasible, um, and can be safely delivered. Uh, and we can talk about the, the, the arm of the gem carbo, which failed to enroll for various reasons, and then that can be a topic of a separate conversation. 
Sure. No, that's really, really helpful to kind of know the history of sort of how we got to this particular point. Um, I think we are seeing uh, in upper tract disease, the, the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy becoming, you know, accepted standard of care. In fact, in sort of guidelines and national meetings, we've sort of seen this brought up and we're seeing that engagement from both urologists and physicians, uh, which has been exciting to see. Um, it still is sometimes a little bit relatively new to some folks. And so I was wondering, Dr. Grivas, if you could kind of just um, highlight for our audience, what particular patients are we trying to enroll in this study? So what are the eligibility um, for patients that we should be considering this study for? Thank you, Noah. I'm very excited to work with all of you in this very, very important trial. In this particular trial, we are focusing on patients with high-grade upper tract urothelial carcinoma that was proven by biopsy within two months, 60 days, prior to randomization. And the diagnosis comes from, from upper urinary tract mass diagnosis on cross-sectional imaging or a direct tumor visualization during endoscopy uh, when it's done by urologists before referral to medical oncology. And we always recommend biopsy as a standard of care prior to enrollment of the study to document the diagnosis of upper tract high grade urothelial carcinoma. We allow variant histologies as long as the predominant histology is urothelial traditional cell carcinoma. Patients must have adequate organ function and bone marrow function, and we measure, of course, labs at baseline screening, and patients should not have any evidence of metastatic disease or clinically enlarged lymph nodes, uh, one centimeter or larger in a short axis, mm. imaging required within 28 days prior to randomization. Patients should not have any uncontrolled illness, no active infection, no autoimmune disease within two years, and should not have been on immunosuppressive medication, systemic immunosuppression in the last two weeks prior to the first dose of treatment because of Durvalma being a checkpoint inhibitor targeting PDL1. Uh, overall, we look at the patients based on cisplatin eligibility, and we use cisplatin uh, criteria uh, to make sure the patient is fit for cisplatin to make sure they're eligible for uh, the first arm. And we use the creatinine clearance cutoff of uh, 50 cc per minute. Uh, uh, and if the creatinine clearance is higher than that, uh, and patients have no significant hearing loss or significant neuropathy, can be fit for cisplatin. If the creatinine clearance is more than uh, uh, 15, uh, but less than 50, uh, uh, or as up to 50 uh, cc per minute, then they can go to the splatting eligible arm to develop and jump side again. Overall, I would try to, uh, I would say, we try to simplify eligibility criteria to make it pragmatic uh, for the study so patients can enroll to, across different centers. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Grievous. That's, that's incredibly helpful. So I, I think what I did hear from you, though, is that there is a portion of this study that does um, enroll patients who are cisplatin ineligible, you know, in that single arm of gemcitabine durvalumab. So I do think that's important, again, for our audience to know um, that as we open this trial, that we should consider it in really all upper tract patients um, out of the get-go. So that, that's actually very, very helpful information. And also your point about the allowance of some variant histology, I think is a key point. Um, you know, that comes up in many of our trials uh, where some patients are excluded if they have even a minor component, say of squamous or other histology. So I, I think that's very helpful for our audience. Um, I wanted to switch back, uh, Dr. Dr. Margulis, a little bit from the urologist perspective about this um, particular study in this patient population. And just wanted if you could kind of speak a little bit to why should physicians, in particular urologists who are really seeing these patients, you know, as the, as the point person, um, why should they consider this study for their patients? Great question, Noah. And I think that there's certain uh, baseline assumptions that, that uh, they are important. Number one is that high-grade urothelial cancer, or specifically upper tract urothelial cancer, is very difficult to stage, unlike the bladder cancer. Most of the time, by the time it is diagnosed, it's already invasive and has very high probability of having occult metastatic disease. So that's number one. Number two, we know that platinum-based uh, therapies are, are effective in this disease. Uh, these are the, the recent POW trial, which shows significant uh, improvement in uh, disease-free survival. Um, and last and most importantly is the best opportunity to, to give these agents, and this includes immunotherapies and, and platinum-based therapies, is prior to nephrodurectomy. Um, simply put, by the time... Uh, the kidney is removed, there's significant decline in GFR and significant um, decrease in probability of these patients getting any meaningful systemic therapy. And if you look very closely at our trial at, uh, 
earlier ECOG trial, majority of the patients were able to get platinum-based chemotherapy and move on to uh, uh, nephrorectomy. If you look at the PAL trial data, this number drops down into the 60s. Yeah, it's, a, I think it's really important sort of just pragmatic aspects about trying to give our patients the best chance for curative potential with you know, the incorporation of both local and systemic therapy options um, and how the neoadjuvant approach sort of uh, facilitates that a, a little bit um, more consistently. Uh, so I think that's actually some very good points. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it really sets the bar, you know, for why we should be considering this. Um, I want to come back to Dr. Hoffman's census a, a little bit here um, in terms of thinking ahead a little bit. You know, we're trying to really drum up enthusiasm to get the trial going, to get it started, accrued, and get it finished. Um, how might the results of this trial, when it's when it actually completes, transform our, our, our approaches to these patients? And, and what do you hope, you know, could be the potential impact, both short and long term, of EA8192? Yeah, thanks for that question, Noah. And I think, you know, all of us on this call have have been, you know, sitting around conference tables and thinking about how to improve patient care for urothelial cancer, you know, for over a decade now. And it's hard to believe the questions that we're uh, asking now are really these, you know, important ones. We couldn't even fathom asking them a long time ago. You know, I think one of the most important things that's going to come out of this trial is the fact that upper tract urothelial cancer, you know, really can be considered its, its own disease and should. You know, a lot of what we do or don't understand about upper tract urothelial cancer comes from, you know, the, the data that we try and interpret in subgroup analyses. And I, I don't think we've done such a great job of it. And, you know, to have trials like PALP, you know, that show that you really can complete a randomized phase three trial in upper tract disease is important. It's inspiring. It's the benchmark and we need to keep going. So I think that that's important. I think that it continues conversations, you know, between our urology colleagues and medical oncology taking care of patients with high grade urothelial cancer, either of the bladder or the upper tract, it's a multidisciplinary process. And we are constantly you know, in communication, both from a clinical perspective, as well as from a research perspective with our colleagues in these other disciplines. And so it's important to recognize that those conversations need to happen. Even if a patient might not go on a clinical trial, I think knowing what we feel is the standard of care, knowing what we feel like is a, a standard conversation about neoadjuvant chemo, a standard conversation about what a lymph node dissection looks like in this in this uh, patient population is important. And then finally, to really get kind of clear, defined answers with survival endpoints for this population will be important. I don't think I could have said it any better. <laughs> that was that was uh, uh, inspiring. And I, I think, as you point out, um, you know, it's a critical juncture, you know, in time for upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And I think you're mentioning about we need to, to treat it as a different disease, um, I think is well put. And I think um, one of the important um, benchmarks of this particular trial is again, to further build on sort of the PALT study in the adjuvant setting, but to also show that these uh, upper tract patients, number one, they're there, but number two, the investigators, physicians recognize them and um, you know, are able to study them independently. Uh, you know, and I think we all believe that and have shown that before, uh, it's an important, uh, you know, important measure for us to, to accomplish. Um, so I think we're all very, very enthusiastic about this particular study in particular. Um, Dr. Margulis and Dr. Grievous, I just want to kind of ask you any, any sort of additional thoughts about the, the study itself or, or its operational aspects um, that you, you want to mention to the audience uh, before we close the, the session? Yeah, yeah, I would say just want to bring the very important point. I mean, I think that the, the uh, low GFR platinum ineligible patients is a very important key aspect of the study and it really allows us to, to bring the neoadjuvant strategy to every patient with urothelial cancer. Um, and so that, that's very exciting. And there's great preclinical ration and clinical rationale for combining, for example, gemcitabine and then the checkpoint inhibitor. So I look forward to the results of this. And it's a very exciting trial to, to, to be open. I totally agree with uh, Ginny and Vitali. I think this trial definitely focuses on upper tract urothelial cancer, which is more common than we think, and we have significant diagnostic and therapeutic dilemmas in the clinic. So we are very, very excited that this trial is ongoing. It's a very important study to answer specific questions. And also, as Vitali mentioned, we are capturing patients with creatinine clearance, you know, as low as 
more than 15 cc per minute. So we allow patients with low uh, GFR to be able to uh, get systemic therapy. Uh, and I think that's important because we're trying to be pragmatic in the design of the study, capturing as many patients as we can and be able to apply the results in clinical practice. So this trial is opening across different sites to the cooperative groups. eco is running the study. Hopefully the study will open in multiple centers and hopefully will be accrued in a meaningful amount of time to answer the critical question, how do we manage patients with upper tract urothelial cancer and whether neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy should or not be the standard of care. We're very excited and thank you so much for the time today. Thanks so much, Dr. Grivas. And uh, on behalf of Dr. Hoffman Census, Dr. Margulis, Dr. Grivas, uh, I wanna thank you, our audience for joining us today. Um, again, it's EA8192, uh, it's phase three trial of dervolumab and chemotherapy for patients with high grade upper tract urothelial cancer prior to nephrouterectomy. It is open, it is accruing, it is uh, you know, very near to you across the country. Um, if there are any questions about this particular trial, please do not hesitate to reach out to Dr. Hoffman Census, Dr. Margulis, Dr. Grievous, myself, or other ECOG-ACRID staff. Um, thank you so much.